classes in polymer dynamics based on George Philly's book Phenomenology of Polymer Solution Dynamics Cambridge University Press 2011 and today this lecture is lecture 19 quasi-elastic light scattering spectroscopy and the light scattering spec in any event Today we are going to finish off our discussion of colloids. There's one little bit that's going to be postponed to later in the course. And we will take up our discussion of um, quasi-elastic light scattering from non-dilute polymer systems. <coughs> Let me remind you of what we found when we discussed colloid systems. First of all, we have a series of parameters like the self-diffusion coefficient, and the mutual diffusion coefficient, and the rotational diffusion coefficient. And each of these have some concentration dependence, the concentr useful concentration being the volume fraction. The important point I want to make is that this constant is different for these three parameters. But in point of fact, if one does reasonable calculations, one can calculate what the slope is for all three parameters, and you get reasonable answers. The statement that you get reasonable answers um, tends to say that you understand what the forces are. Now, you, could, you could by accident get one of these right, but this parameter depends on the hydrodynamic interactions in, and also the direct interactions in very different ways for these three constants. And the fact that you can get all three of them more or less right tends to say that you really do have an understanding of how hydrodynamic interactions work in colloid systems. If you look at the light scattering spectrum of these systems, and this is actually true not only for the light scattering spectrum from a dilute monodispersed system, but also from a tracer system, you find that the spectrum is bimodal. That is, there's something that approximates being a fast decaying mode, and there's something that approximates a slow decaying mode. Now, what does light scattering spectroscopy do? It looks for fluctuations in the concentrations of part the particles. If the concentration were absolutely uniform, there would be no light scattering. You get light scattering because there are regions where momentarily, due to Brownian motion, there are fluctuations. And therefore, there are regions where momentarily the concentration is unusually large or unusually small. It is the fluctuations in the concentration of particles that lead to the scattering of light. And it is the relaxation of those fluctuations that leads to a scattering spectrum. Now, the one thing that has to be remembered, we'll be doing this in more detail in a bit in this lecture, is that light scattering spectroscopy is driven by a single spatial Fourier component of the concentration of particles. And therefore, you aren't looking at here as a lump of particles. You are looking at here is a cosine wave fluctuation of some size. Now, all of the cosine wave of all different wave vectors are fluctuating at the same time, but, you only, but the light scattering picks out one of them. The one it picks out is determined by the wavelength of the laser and by the scattering angle. And the, the picking out detail is the same as the first order Born approximation found in uh, scattering physics. So you say you have two modes, fast and slow, and there is an automatic and totally incorrect re response, which is to say that you're looking at particles moving over small distances and large distances. That's completely and totally wrong. The reason it's completely and totally wrong is that you are working at fixed Q. The distance scale for particle motion to which you are sensitive is something like r is something like the inverse of q and so at all times you are looking at motion at the same distance scale 
what you are saying is that on this distance scale, there are some fluctuations that are transient and don't last very long, and there are some fluctuations that are persistent. The particles have either packed up close together or have spread out and made a bubble in solution in which there's a low concentration of particles. And whatever they are doing, the slow mode corresponds to the persistent fluctuations, and the fast mode corresponds to the transient fluctuations. Now, if you actually do particle tracking from colloid systems, you can actually see somewhat what's going on, and what you see corresponds to what is going on in computer simulations. That is, you form some sort of dynamic structure in which the particles stay together for a long time and don't move very rapidly. And you also, and these are lumps, and you also have ribbons, this is by direct observation of doing particle tracking, along which the particles can move fairly rapidly, but only parallel to the ribbon. I emphasize there are no this is not polymer coils, these are spheres, but you get trails in which the lead particle can move rapidly and then other particles can follow in its wake, so to speak. If you look at the slow fl fluctuation, even for the slow fluctuation, we find that the diffusion coefficient and the viscosity are both concentration dependent, but their product goes up as the concentration goes up. So what we are saying is that um, you do see non-Stokes-Einsteinian effects even in colloid systems. In addition to this, we talked briefly about concentration versus and how it drives viscosity, eta. And what we find is that at lower concentrations, there's a stretched exponential concentration dependence. There's then a crossover to a power law. The crossover is quite sharp. How sharp? Well, there are a few experiments where people have managed to get an experimental point very close to here, and it appears to be right at the intersection of the two lines. This power region is a power law. This point occurs when the viscosity divided by the viscosity of the solvent is about 10 plus or minus 5, and the volume fraction is about 0.4 to 0.45. Different workers' data, the analysis showing this transition is mine. The, the data are in the literature, from the literature, find the transition at modestly different locations, and it's not quite clear why one might propose that this effect is very sensitive to short-range interactions between the colloids, and different samples give slightly different results. This point is very different from another point up here, which is at phi of about 0.49, and an eta over eta zero of about 50. And that is the concentration at which according to computer studies that are actually quite old, uh, you start to form a biphasic region in the system. And since you are forming a biphasic region, well, it's interesting to ask what happens at the edge of the biphasic region. Um, the statement that you're forming a biphasic region undoubtedly could use additional experimental and calculational work. OK, so we have discussed this. The last point I want to make in summary, we will briefly talk about, in fair part, protein systems. The reason we talk about protein systems is that proteins are globular, they are highly monodisperse, and they are charged. Uh, why are proteins charged? Because they have on their surface groups like carboxylic acid, or an amine, they're also secondary amines, that's a primary, 
And the carboxylic acid can ionize, and here comes a proton out into solution. And the protons can bind to the amine. At neutral pH, most of these things are charged up. If you go to very acid conditions, you can force protons down onto these. If you go to very basic conditions, you can strip the protons off of here. And if you plot the charge of a protein molecule versus the pH, you get a smooth curve. Of course, eventually the curve has to flatten out because everything is either ionized or not. The shape of that curve can be calculated with great precision using statistical mechanics and electrostatics. You can use nuclear magnetic resonance to track for an identifiable one of these groups, one at a time, whether the group is neutral or charged. And look, statistical mechanics works. You can calculate the charging curve for each group in a protein molecule if you know the structure. And you can do that with great precision. And so you can calculate this curve, which is quite smooth, um, and you can get charge versus pH. Well, having said that, suppose you measure the, do light scattering and measure the mutual diffusion of proteins in solution. We have proteins in solution, and so we get concentration fluctuations, more here, less there. And the mutual diffusion coefficient describes the relaxation of the concentration gradient. Uh, what happens? Well, the forces between the protein molecules drive the relaxation. And there are direct interactions, for example, screened electrostatic. There are hydrodynamic interactions. As a particle moves, it sets up a wake, a fluid flow in the surrounding solution that drags the proteins along. You can actually calculate this. We talked about it for hard spheres. Now, what happens is that if you have proteins that are fairly highly charged and you start reducing the salt concentration or you change the pH to drive up the charge, the forces between the protein molecules increase. They're all charged the same, so the forces are repulsive. And the net result is that the interactions drive up the diffusion coefficient. And you can actually describe this in terms of something that you can refer to the osmotic pressure, a drag coefficient, which you can also calculate. And then, as I discussed last time, a reference frame correction, which refers to the fact that if the proteins are moving this way and the fluid is incompressible, the simplest case, if the proteins are headed as indicated, some of the solvent gets pushed the other way, and this modest effect can actually be calculated. Having said we can do this calculation, um, there is an interesting bit here, namely there is an alternative form that is sometimes used to describe mutual diffusion of uh, macromolecules, which is a D is a KT over 6 pi eta psi. And psi is called the dynamic scaling length. This formula comes out of critical phenomena. If you have a mixture of two liquids that phase separate, and you change the temperature and the pressure enough, you can often arrange things so that there is temperature and pressure beyond which the liquids are miscible in all proportions. Right at the point where the two liquids become miscible, there is what is known as a critical point. And at the critical point, the concentration fluctuations become very large. And at the same time, the concentration fluctuations become large. The diffusion slows down a great deal. And therefore, 
what one observes is the dynamic scaling length becomes long, the length over which particle motions are correlated becomes long, and in this system, correspondingly, diffusion slows down. Indeed, it slows down asymptotically as the critical point is approached. In these systems, precisely the opposite thing occurs. If you take the proteins and you charge them up or you reduce the salt concentration, their interactions are made stronger. Because the interactions are made stronger and longer range, as you do the things I just described, the distance over which particle motions are correlated increases. However, at the same time that this correlation length for dynamic motions increases, diffusion speeds up. It speeds up a great detail, deal. For example, there are nice experiments by Doherty and Benedek, and they observed up to a threefold increase in the diffusion coefficient of bovine serum albumin and water as they did various things to change the pH and the salt concentration. Calculating that increase, cal doing the calculation for a charge system is not trivial. However, experimentally, phenomenologically, you make the interactions stronger, the repulsive interactions, and therefore the diffusion coefficient goes up. At the same time, the correlation length for interactions goes up at this also, and therefore this, this formula, which comes out of critical phenomena, is totally and completely wrong as applied to macromolecule diffusion. It gives completely a wrong physical impression of what is happening. Okay, so that is, that is the sort of thing we have found by dealing with um, diffusion coefficients. And we're now going to push on to the next chapter. And we are now going to check, talk in the next chapter about quasi-elastic light scattering. And we are mostly going to be talking about quasi-elastic light scattering as applied to binary systems. That is, we will have a system in which we have a solvent. And you notice this goes on a piece. There is an abbreviation. There's the abbreviation. And having put down the abbreviation, the notion is we have a mixture, and there are is a solvent, which is more or less invisible. And there are things, I'm drawing colloids. They're faster to draw. But they could just as well be polymer coils. And we study the light scattering spectroscopy. There's, we send in laser, a laser beam, and here is K incident, the wave vector of the incident light. We observe scattering through some angle. There's the wave vector of the scattered light. We have quasi-elastic light scattering because the light does not change frequency color significantly during, well, 1 part in 10 to the 10. The frequency doesn't change, so the two wave vectors are equal in magnitude, but point in different directions. And the amount of scattering, this is, does this look familiar? If you think back to quantum theory of scattering, do you, did you see the Born approximation? Good. Well, this is just the Born approximation, except the things are a little bigger than the inside of a proton, and they it takes longer to happen. But the math is the same, and therefore, the scattered field is proportional to some scattering cross-section, and in a binary system, the scattering cross-section is the same for all the scattering particles, so we drop it out. <coughs> 
And it's proportional to how bright the incident light is. If you make the incident br light brighter, make the incident field E0 larger, the scattering gets larger. And then there is a sum over all the particles in the system. E to the i, square root of minus 1i, k scattered. What's k scattered, which is usually called k? It's k final minus k incident dot position of particle i at time t. The reason I put in the t is that that term includes interference between scattering from one particle and another. It includes uh, interference because the scattering volume in a typical experiment, you may have a focusing lens here, you have collecting optics here with some pinholes, there is a region in which you are collecting scattering, which might be, oh, 100 microns across, and is surely less than one millimeter long, the light, the visible light, you're using a laser. It has a coherence length of kilometers, typical experiment. Across this distance, the visible light is coherent, and therefore you can see interference between scattering from different particles. Another way to interpret this picture is to say this is a Michelson interferometer. Each of the molecules acts like a little mirror. You have a very large number of teeny, teeny, tiny, tiny little mirrors in there, and the intensity of the scattered light is determined by the interference, amount of interference. As the particles move, the amount of interference changes, and so does the intensity of the scattered light. So, having said that the intensity of the scattered light is going to vary on very long time scales, because the particles don't move that fast, how do you characterize it? And the answer is that we measure the scattering spectrum. So here is the spectrum of the scattered light. It is both theoretically and experimentally more convenient to work in time rather than frequency domain, but the time domain and the frequency domain, it's a math issue. It's Fourier's theorem, basically. The time and frequency domain are obliged to give you the same information, uh, and even though it's, this is time domain, we call it the spectrum, we take the intensity of the scattered light scattered with one Q, or K, at time T, and the intensity at some later t plus tau, we multiply these together, and we add up over a lot of separate times t. And we end up with something, I should be notationally consistent, in which, in the end, the scattering spectrum is only determined by the time separation between these two. For, well, OK. So we have the intensity, the intensity is proportional to the square of the field. And so if you wrote the intensities out in terms of the field, you would get a four sums. Fortunately, there's a physics simplification. Here is the system, it's very big. Here is the distance over which particle positions and motions are correlated. It's very small. As a result, you have a vast number of terms with four particles in them, and you have a reasonable number of terms in which two of the particles are within the same volume. But the number of terms in which you have two particles in the same volume is huge relative to the number of terms of this to the fourth power in there, the number of terms that put four particles in one volume. As a result, this object is dominated by two particle terms.
and we can write S of QT is equal to, well, there's a constant A, and there's something called G1 of Q. Um, Q and K are the two symbols for the scattering vector, and I will wander between them. Squared plus B. And G1 of QT is the dynamic structure factor. It's also known as the intermediate scattering function. And G1 of QT is equal to, what's it equal to? I'm going to do a sum over all of the particles in the system, all capital N of them, and I'm going to do a double sum because G1 of Q and T is a product of two of those. So there's an E0 square and an alpha square. All the particles are the same, so they have the same scattering. Alpha square is the scattering cross-section. E to the I, Q dot RM at some time, tau, minus i q dot r n at some time tau plus t. And you're seeing interference between pairs of particles. Now you have to be a little careful because this sum includes m equals n terms. And in that case, you're seeing one particle at one time and the same particle at a different time. But it also includes m not equal to n terms, in which you're looking at one particle at one time and a different particle at a second time. So this is how G1 is related to particle positions. There are also here two constants, a and b. Uh, the constant a is a normalizing factor. If you go through the literature, you'll discover there are lots of people who are happy to quote normalizing factors. They're different. It doesn't matter, as long, within reason, how you quote the normalizing factor because it's a constant. The constant has no effect on the time dependence of this function. The only place where it matters a bit what you're doing is that if you say, I have some external means of calculating A, and you put in the wrong value for A, or there's noise so your value of A is off a bit, <clears throat> this object, what is this object, how does this object behave at zero time? At zero time, tau and t plus tau become equal, and there's some quantity that you reach at time zero. And if you put in the wrong normalizing constant A, there's some minor hazard of messing yourself up a bit. B is the long-term limit. How do you measure the long-term limit? Well, you have a device that actually calculates this coral. This thing, I've said spectrum, this is actually also a correlation function. The function of the variable at one time, the variable at a second time. You see that? And the correlation function is a function of the time separation. Well, you can actually measure these experimentally. They're complicated machines for doing that. And if you actually do this thing, do this calculation, uh, you can measure out to very long times, and you discover that the spectrum goes out and becomes a constant at very long times. Uh, there are methods of calculating what the constant should be, which are worthwhile checks, but you can actually measure this directly, and when you measure it directly, there are certain fluctuations that give you noise here that is repeated there, and if you measure directly, that noise gets subtracted out. 
So you are actually measuring the dynamic structure factor. The dynamic structure factor can be split into two terms. So G1 of QT is equal to G one S of Q T. This is the self part of the dynamic structure factor plus G one D. Those are superscripts. Same function of Q in time. And the other part is the distinct Uh, what can we say about the self and distinct parts? Where do they come from? They both come from this double sum. The self part are the terms in which m is equal to n. So you are looking at the same particle at two times. The distinct terms are the terms in which m is not equal to n. Now you might say, gee, there, aren't there going to be a whole pile more distinct terms than there are self terms? And the answer is, yeah, there are going to be a lot more distinct terms than there are self terms. However, however, in the self term, distinct terms, what has to be the case is the particles m and n have to start out or end up rather close to each other, and because if they aren't, their positions at the se at, say the start time are uncorrelated. If they're halfway across the system from each other, the two ter the two positions are uncorrelated, and the contribution to the distinct term averages to zero. Why? Well, if the two particles are out here, they could be out here, or they could be half a wavelength closer. And those two states are about are very nearly equally likely because they're way far apart, particles are way far apart from each other. But while the particles are being way far apart from each other, um, the contributions to this object average zero. We have a particle, and only the particle near neighbors contribute to the distinct part of the correlation function. Well, the number of near neighbors is very small, you know, 3, 12, whatever. And therefore, this term, the m not equal to n term, and the self term, the m equal to n term, are at least vaguely the same size. There is a specific exception. And the specific exception are tracer experiments. In tracer experiments, we have a background fluid, which could be a polymer solution, invisible polymers mixed with solvent, things we do not see. And dropped into there are dilute particles. The particles that are doing the scattering are almost always very far apart from each other. And because they're almost always very far apart from each other, the position of pairs of particles, pairs of scatters, are uncorrelated. And as a result, under tracer conditions, the self term is, gives us a, essentially all of the contribution to G1. And the distinct term, in which you're looking at correlations and positions of pairs of scatterers, averages very nearly to zero. This is how tracer diffusion experiments get done with light scattering spectroscopy. So under tracer conditions, the distinct terms vanish. Well, having said the distinct terms vanish, you then ask, well, what information does G1, do G1S and G1D give us about the system? I shall skip the math, but the core answer is 
there is a probability distribution. And this is the distribution the tracer particle of interest will take a step delta x during time t. Well, this object for Brownian particles in a simple solvent is a Gaussian in delta x. If we are in a polymer system, we find, and we're doing tracer, we find that G1 is typically not, not unimodal. This is a plot of log G1 versus T. And G1 is not unimodal. And correspondingly, Dube's theorem, which I've mentioned before, P of delta X and T is not a Gaussian. It's something more complicated. However, the self-distribution function, the self part of the dynamic structure factor, gives us the likelihood that a given particle will take a step delta x during time t. Now, actually inverting the spectrum to get to delta this function requires that you do the, Q, the dependence on q for a series of a lot of q's. Uh, it requires that you have high precision measurements. And what you can actually determine are the even moments of the average over p of the even moments of delta x. The odd moments average to 0. That's a symmetry outcome. But you can measure the even moments, or at least some of them. And you can measure them by doing the q-dependence at, at any time you want. So you could actually get, an, get approximate information about this function. If the particles are not dilute, life becomes less pleasant. Let's take a finer detailed view on what P is. And P, the, the likelihood that a particle will displace some distance delta during time t, it actually is modulated by the position of all of the m particles in the system. Here is a list. It's a list of particle where particle 1 is, particle 2 is, out to particle, I guess I called it m, all of the particles in the system at time t. p of delta and t is equal to an average over all the starting positions. So there's, they're going to add up over all the starting positions of all of the particles. And there is a P of delta T R M. There's the list of all the starting positions. And there's an E to the minus beta potential energy minus a normalizing factor. Uh, and that is the actual P of delta T, the thing that the self part of the distribution function talks about. And this is in terms of where all the starting positions are. Why do the starting positions matter? Well, here is a particle. And at time zero, if I give you no other information, it's more or less equally likely to move in any direction at once. On the other hand, at time zero, if there are three neighboring particles here, and the particles all repel each other, these steps tend to turn into those motions, bounce back. These steps get enhanced. And therefore, if I give you information about where all of the particles are at time zero, I've given you information about what steps this one particle, the particle of interest, is likely to do, what the step is likely to be over the time of t. Well, there is a fair amount of crank turning. And it turns out that the distinct part of the correlation function is determined by the probability that a particle 1 will take a step during time t. That's what it is. 
and it's determined in part by the vector from the particle of interest to one neighboring particle during time t. And it comes through as an e to the i q dot r12. And then you average over where the last particle is. And this effect, this term, which comes out of the exponential in here, says that the probability of displacement during time t is due to a spatial Fourier transform of the complicated um, distribution function with respect to the position of one other variable. Now you might say, gee, could we make that term go away by going to small q? And the answer is that if you go to small q, if you really go to small q, the g's go from 1 or 0 and have not yet started to decay. You can look at the initial slope of g1 self and g1 distinct. You can look at the initial slopes of these two functions. That's the simplest time dependence to calculate. And if you do that, you discover that this object contributes substantially to how fast the relaxations take place. Okay, so that is a discussion of light scattering spectroscopy. And now we chug ahead and we're going to apply this to a polymer solution. And if we apply it to a polymer solution, there is a complication. And the complication is, here is a colloid. It's a rigid body. If you scatter light from the colloid, you can get interference between light rays scattered from different parts of the same colloid. But as long as the colloid is a sphere, that interference, well, modulates the intensity of the scattered light, but it has no effect on the time dependence. Why? Because that interference happens even if this is a sphere. It doesn't change if I rotate the sphere. It's just that there is scattering from different parts of the sphere. For polymer, life is a little more uh -oh, something. Here's a polymer coil on sort of the same scale. And we have a light ray that chugs along and is scattered off a polymer bead here and heads off towards the detector. And we have a light ray that chugs along and gets here and is scattered off towards the detector. And gee, the polymer is flexible, isn't it? That means that as time goes on, I'll draw it as a dashed line, the polymer coil can change shape. There's the new shape. This piece has now moved from here to here. And the scattering that reaches the detector has a different path length than it did before. As a result, the internal motions of the polymer contribute to the time dependence of the scattered light. In order to do that, this distance has to be sort of comparable with a light wavelength. If the polymer, the traditional distance scale, which I've just stuck in like that, is the radius of gyration. If the polymer radius of gyration is much smaller than the light wavelength, that is if Rg times the scattering vector q is much less than 1, the polymer can change shape and the interference doesn't change because it's almost 0. The distance from here to here is tiny relative to a light wavelength. And so light scattered from here and from here comes off with about the same phase. However, you can make really big polymers. And because you can make really big polymers, <coughs> as the polymer changes shape, 
you get a contribution to the time dependence of the spectrum. I see, however, because of time constraints, I am out of time today. And therefore, in the next lecture, we will continue to discuss how this effect contributes to light scattering from polymers. But that's it for today. We're done.